Hey, what's up guys? In this video, I'm going to be going over my mixing chain. Now, this is just a series of techniques depending on the audio material that I use to mix audio. And the mixing chain goes right down here. And a mixing chain is basically uh, a single effect or a series of effects in uh, parallel or in series that will affect the signal to make it sit well with other signals in your track called mixing. And it's a way to make tracks sound baller. So, Let's start out with, let's say, like 90% of the time I'm going to be, whatever it is, I want to attenuate the signal with an EQ. Now this is basically what I use. I can use an EQ8, or I'll use something uh, a little bit more kind of robust and high quality. Uh, they're both high quality, but the uh, Pro-Q2 is a specialized kind of plugin that I can use to mix and things like this and uh yeah i'll usually have an eq at the beginning of the chain right when you know a lot of things kind of come out the only exception is, is if uh it's a vocal then i'll have a de-esser at the beginning and a de-esser is basically a fancy multi-band compressor that detects the s sounds that are kind of harsh and makes your ears hurt and uh yeah it, i've used quite a bit of de-essers especially in the last uh the last record and uh this one seemed to be the most robust because we had a lot of uh like direct recording a lot of like affected vocals so uh, it wasn't you know just dry it was like affected so you know you kind of had to go in there and carve it out so to speak and it was kind of challenging um so yeah i'll use a ds at the beginning and i'll use a ds or part way down the chain a lot of people do that and i was like oh my god you can like use multiple de-essers because as you process the vocal the uh the s's the sibilance will uh come back up so uh yeah like closer to the end of the chain you can bring them back down and it works quite well and uh if it's transparent you know use it who uh, gives a hoot before uh the eq8 also depending on what's going on i'll use a gate now gates are essentially um, think of them as compressors, but as the signal goes above a certain amount, it will, well, before that, it'll be silent, right? And the audio only comes out when the audio peaks through a certain uh, level. So, say if you have, uh, if you uh, mic a drum set. Oh, no, if you're, okay, I got a better example. If you're recording a vocalist and uh, there's like, well, she's not, singing or anything there's a lot of negative space where you hear like you know stuff coming through the headphone mix or her breathing or he him breathing um you don't want to have that and you only want the audio to come through and eliminate the noise floor when audio needs to actually come through so a lot of this happens on uh drum kits like you know overheads and like snare snare microphones like a snare is not going all the time right so you know if that mic is left if that audio signal is left on there's no gate on it that will kind of accumulate so you want to kind of make it clean so anyway i've gone on enough about gates so that is that right there so in uh i guess that was that would be in like conventional like recording an album a band or whatever or doing something live uh like real instruments quote unquote that's what i'll i'll do uh but for the majority of the time i will have an eq8 and the next thing i will have is a compressor right i want to have an eq before the compressor and then after that's really important because i want if i had like a compressor kind of you know after the EQ. No, no, sorry. If I had the compressor before the EQ and I was changing something, this, like, if I boosted this up, this would really affect the compressor, right? So the first EQ, I should really explain. The first EQ is to kind of carve out the signal and get it ready for the compressor. So I want to, like, you know, not have so much low end, maybe use, like, some sort of surgical uh, high pass just to kind of clean it up in quotation marks. If I have, say, like, cymbals. And there's like they're like all over the place. I'll gently high pass things. Don't be afraid to high pass things, but don't high pass too much. Kind of do that just to kind of prepare it for the compressor. You know, something like that typically. 
uh, Ableton 10, which I'm using, the EQ has changed, so that'll, uh, that there wouldn't be exactly there. I'd have to kind of figure it out. And then I'd have my compressor. And this compressor would be there to kind of, depending on what it is. So if it's like a, a drum or a snare, like a, like a percussion hit, and I wanted it to be more punchy and to kind of preserve dynamics, but to make it like, you know, you know, not as round, but more like snappy, you know, I'd have like a, a kind of a higher ratio, bring the threshold down and have the attack open up and then have the release like this, depending on the, the BPM and what's going on, just so it's more snappy, like uh, look up a tutorial on compressing snares to make it sound like, you know, like super heavy metal rock. And that's what I'd be doing. And that'd be for those sort of things. Um, if it's, say, a, uh, a vocal, I would kind of have it at a gentler ratio and threshold and have a very fast attack. And what that does is it kind of rides it. And I have a, you know, a plethora of different compressors that I use um, for different um, kind of applications. So the Evo compressor is very, you know, robust and good to use, but there's also, you know, this one right here, which is a, a drum bus compressor, which we might get into, but this is more of a, it's more of a, a different flavor on compression, like the release and the attack curves aren't linear, and there's a fixed attack and a fixed ratio, and this model is the uh, SSL, which is uh, the SSL comp, which was used on, you know, many records since the since the 80s and onwards, it's uh, one of those one of those workhorses that you know sounds sounds good on a lot of things, particularly drums and your master bus and all sorts of other things. It also it also kind of it kind of grabs the transients in a fun way, and you can really do some interesting things with this. And that's the uh, glue compressor and another compressor I'll use. All right, so compressors are something that you really need to study. And I'm still a student student myself. This is the uh, Pro-C. This is a different compressor. And there's different styles in this one. This one's more specialized. Uh, so you got a clean, classic, opto, vocal, a mastering, bus, punch, and pumping compressor. These all have different um, ratio and like attack curves and like uh, releases and stuff like that. So a vocal is a fixed ratio and the ratio changes dynamically depending on what's being fed into it. And that's, you know, exceptionally interesting to, uh, to uh, study and be aware of, right? There's no universal compressor. You got to use the right one for the job. Um, there's different kinds, different styles, different emulations. Um, and, yeah, like you can even use tape emulation. Tape is a fancy, subtle compressor as well. Look at those tape emulations. That's actually compression. That's what you're hearing. So keep that in mind. Uh, Opto is also a cleaner mode, right? It uses like a light diode and a light detection unit made famous in the LA-2As. And that is one of these guys. So I'm going to go searching. LA, no, no, CLA. That is the C, the Wave CLA 2A is uh, this guy, this compressor here, right? No ratio, no attack, no release. Uh, there's some fancy things going on in the circuitry. You have gain and peak reduction, and the release and the attack changes on how hard the peak reduction is working. So the CLA-2A works great on vocals, works great on things you want to kind of level out, uh, like, you know, um, acoustic guitars and things like that. It, it levels it out. And the cool thing is you can actually use a bunch of these and not have to worry about noise because you can just turn the noise and the wall hiss out, off, done, finito. Um, and uh, yeah, some of the greatest compressors uh, don't actually sound like they're compressing anything, and this is one of those. And uh, if you want to go crazy, you can go 1176 or look up 76, 
right here. And the CLA 76 is uh, this one. This one has attack and release, but the attack and release are reversed. So that's important to remember. And there's uh, button push buttons for different ratios, right? And then the all in button is uh, when you push all of them in. It's kind of a weird little hack. Input, output, and uh, this would be for, this is a very colorful compressor. Um, I think it's like, it's a, it's a leveling kind of thing, and it adds a lot of color. It's uh, pretty, uh, pretty intense, like for like guitars and bass and, and like leads and, you know, whatever you want. It's, you know, one of the important things. Uh, so you got the blacky and the bluey revision. The blue is one of the first revisions. It was actually kind of noisy and distorting. And then subsequent revisions uh, kind of cleaned it up a bit. But those blue ones are still sought after. It's pretty pretty good. Okay, so we got just uh, digress from there. So we got the EQ, and then we got the compressor. And I'm going to drop in another EQ, because after the compressor kind of grabs things, I want to EQ and shape a bit more. And uh, before, you know, anything else that I'm doing. So I'll drop in another EQ after the compressor. This EQ I will leave alone. Very important, because if you move things around here, this will affect the threshold, obviously. So this is the uh, Pro-Q. I can do all sorts of things like this. It's very clean sounding. And it's, uh, it's one of those EQs that, you know, you can put things anywhere and it sounds super duper, like, neat, right? And uh, tidy and clean. It's a digital EQ. It's extremely high quality. But there are other EQs that are equally as powerful. Uh, this one right here, I'll just drop this in. The API uh, 560. This is one of those ones that go in like, not the Eurorack uh, mounts, but they're a different thing. Um, I forget what they're called. Anyway, they go into like these little uh, lunch boxes, I think. They're called lunch boxes. And this is uh, fixed band EQing. Now these bands were chosen because they were the ones that uh, you would use more often than not um, back in the day recording. So like if you had like, you know, like a ringing in a guitar or uh, like a one note bass sort of thing, you'd be like, oh yeah, you just drop that down here, right? They didn't make these in hardware form. It doesn't work. Like very difficult to do. You can only do this in the digital domain and with like FFT and all this math stuff. This is very crazy math going on here. Um, and, you know, stuff like that. But these are just uh, like just grabbing something, inverting the phase, and then feeding it back in. It's like feedback, more or less, and it's boosting certain frequencies, which is pretty neato. And uh, yeah, you can do a lot here, and you kind of understand, oh yeah, boost that at 4K. That's when people say boost the snare at like 20K for like more whatever. And, and you're just like, why is it such a specific number? That's because of these. These are uh, console EQs. There's a lot of really good ones, like the uh, oops, SSL, uh, SSL channel right here, right? This is um, kind of a, a, a channel strip that was in the SSL consoles, right? There's a compressor in here, but there's also a, uh, a high-pass filter right here, and then a low-pass filter right here. And, you know, we got, like, different frequency ranges you can select. You know, this, this channel strip changed everything. This is another one. Um, and there's so many. And what makes them kind of special is, okay, so let's say kind of boost this right here at 4K, right? You would think that it's, like, a linear a linear uh, curve like this, right? Or not a linear curve, but like a, a, a uniform curve like this. The curve kind of stays the same as you're moving, but that's not how they work. They didn't work perfectly. And the reason why they sound good and have a lot of character, quote unquote, is because they weren't perfect, right? Digital is perfect. 
right? This Ableton compressor is perfect. But the uh, the SSLG comp, there's subtle things that kind of can't handle certain things sometimes, and it's just like, I can't do it. So uh, FabFilter, being very smart, people have this little gear right here. And what this is, is the gain uh, interaction. So with that enabled, it will kind of adjust the cue as you increase the gain. Like the cue would actually change as you're kind of messing around with it. You know what I'm saying? Right? So you can do all sorts of stuff with that. Like the cue will actually change. So yeah, so at, at lower values, those EQs, the, uh, the API, for example, have very wide um, influence on the frequencies. And as you go up, let's turn that off. As you go up, the, this would kind of ring more. And yeah, that's the reason why they sound like they do. And that's why there's, you know, a use for uh, uh, analog equipment, because analog equipment isn't perfect. Um, okay, so there's those. So I'll have the EQ, compressor, another EQ. And, you know, from here, I will add some creative effects. If there isn't any already, I'll want to, you know, send this to a reverb uh, chain. You know, a reverb will really, it will kind of affect it. You know, in such a way, it'll push it back. It'll make it wider. It'll make the vocals, for example, sound more intimate, or make it sound bigger. Right, a lot you can do with a reverb. Uh, I'll also have you know some delay, such as uh, this. And you know, I usually have the delay before the reverb. I think that's really important um, because you don't want the reverb to kind of ring out like that. You want the reverb to sound kind of real or as real as like real can be and uh yeah it just sounds better this way you can also uh group things and do processing in such a way so that it's in parallel so you'll have this like this that's kind of broken i will drag my reverb create a chain and then i'll drag my reverb to this chain so i have delay and then reverb, what I want to do is have this all the way wet, and then all the way wet here, and then create a new chain, and this will be my dry. Here's so I got my dry signal, my delayed signal, and my reverb signal. And I have control over everything. I can also do this in like buses, not buses, but like sends. But I prefer to kind of do things this way, just because I'm stubborn and that's how I roll. And these would be kind of like time-based effects or things to kind of, you know, accentuate uh, the vibe that we're going for. So for a snare, especially if the snare has a gate on it, I will give it room again, a reverb that I like. And it'll be a consistent reverb with other things in the track. Um, yeah, drum drum processing is a totally different beast but yeah so yeah creative effects in that way and uh yeah those are i guess time-based delay reverb is just a fancy delay i will you know let's just get you know like I, I have it kind of set in a thing and depending on what i'm doing i'll add another compressor and this compressor would be say uh a lot more gentle because there's a lot of time-based effects going on i kind of want to keep it uniform and if anything kind of pokes out i want to uh kind of have a ratio like that bring the threshold down just so there's no there's not a whole lot of it's grabbing the audio in a way that i enjoy and i'll use uh this compressor or the uh the, the la2a or you know things like that um you know you can't go you can't go wrong um, with like creative effects, like I've seen and heard everything done, it uh, it works quite well. So from here, what would I do? Well, I could call it a day and add a sidechain compressor on it and send that to the kick. But there's all the other things you can do. So you want to 
have more control in the mix. You're never going to guess what I'm going to use. You can use all sorts of things. You can have uh, two compressors in, uh, in series, right? So you can have one compressor. Like this compressor is kind of uh, grabbing everything. This one could make things more punchy. You can have the punchiness, right? And if you use compressors in series, it doesn't sound like compression when you are compressing, but it doesn't sound as obvious, right? You know, we have a near infinite PC power and we can do things like this and it's really cool. So it's like getting the punchiness, you know, accentuating the attack on things. And then this compressor kind of writing the audio in a, in a pleasing way to make things kind of more cohesive with everything else. So one thing I would do, let's say, let's say I go like, uh, I want to, at the end stage, I'd want to control the, the stereo. So I'd use something like a harmonizer or like the has effect. And what this does is this kind of pitches the left and right independently, and you can add delay and feedback, and it makes the sound wide overall. Um, you can also do like a, like a killer sort of thing where there's a, a built-in kind of has effect. I think you can buy it for like $3 or something like that. And uh, yeah, you have a delay time, fixed delay time. The left and the right are delayed, and this makes the sound wider. And these would be like stereo effects, which is pretty cool. So from here, what I would do is I would add another EQ, like the final EQ of Doom. And this one would be to control, you know, the tone and the stereo width. And how you do that is you have like a channel mode down here. You go mid-side. And now you are independently, independently controlling the mono and the stereo, right? So something common that a lot of people do is you just kind of do this, select side, which is the stereo, and then you just high pass the side. Or if I have, you know, all that reverb going on and it's not, it's not kind of poking through in a way that I want, or it's poking through too much, I can attenuate that reverb because reverb and delay are, you know, the separate signals from the, the mono, and I can really kind of shape things that way and uh, give it a bit more mid, you know, certain areas, right? So it's linked, solo, and mid, right? And it says right here, S, and then this is linked. I should probably have that, that. So this is burp, the S, which is the stereo signal, and it's really useful, super useful. Like, you couldn't do this back in the day. And now you have control over the, uh, the wide signal. And typically, the reason why you do this is because, like, really wide signals in the low end tend to cancel each other out. So your bases should be all mono. And, you know, a lot of other things. There shouldn't be any kind of stereo width in the low end. And uh, Ableton 10 actually has, like, a really cool feature, a utility where you can uh, base mono uh, below a certain point. So 500 hertz and below, it's all mono. Don't worry about it, which is pretty cool. Pretty cool utility there. So from uh, there, funny enough, there's a utility on it. I will bring it up to uh, Unity Gain, right? I will make sure this is, if it's like low volume, I will bring up the gain and uh, I'll bring it up to Unity. So that then I have maximum control uh, with my levels here. And the reason why I want to do that is because as you get down to the levels, like fine adjustments are more difficult, right? More, you'll, you can just try it yourself. It's more difficult when they're down here for fine tune adjustments. Uh, between like the zero and 10 range, it's very easy to make those really smooth adjustments. Uh, to really, you know, get a, a polish sound. So from there, you know, let's say you're all golden. Let's, um, like, you know, like um, another mixing chain situation. Say if you have, like, two audio tracks, and they're similar, right? They're similar. So it'd be like, I don't know, uh... Uh, all all drums basically. So it's like your drum your drum bus. You can send that to something, but you can also group them. 
let's pretend this is a drum bus. So you got all these similar things that you want to be put together in like, you know, in a space, right? And they, and they sound pretty good, but you want to take them to the next level. So what you want to do is follow the same kind of a situation. Um, if you have to put an EQ before, you probably should fix something in the mix, but there's no rules, like, who cares? Let's say, you know, there's a bit of, uh, you know, a bit of the, the hi-hat that's up here. You know, you can just kind of get that all smooth. You want to prepare it for the compressor. And yeah, I hate to spoil the, the plot for you, but yeah, you're going to want to add a compressor in there. So you'll add, like, a glue compressor, which will glue the, the, the bus of all your drums together. Like your kick, your snare, your hi-hats, and all that. You want to glue those together. And uh, also, yeah, you want to pan things. Really important. Like panning saves your life. You want to pan the hi-hats off to the side. The thing that is center is the kick. Uh, more often than not. Uh, and the vocals, too. Like very few things have exclusivity to the center channel. To like directly down the middle. Um, so yeah, you want to pan things, and you can do that in the, you know, the, the mixing stage, quote-unquote. Like, the mixing stage would be, like, just volume and panning, which is, you know, independent volume of the left and right. So you can use, uh, the glue compressor, or you can use the, uh, compressor for, uh, pro, like, fab filters uh, compressor. You can use, like, the bus option. You know what? There is no universal compressor. There's no universal EQ. You kind of have to experiment and use a bunch of them. And uh, yeah, you want things in your drum bus to be glued together. And that's, uh, you know, having uh, an attack kind of poke through, if you'd like. If you'd like, like, really slamming drums. And what you want is you want to have, like, uh, like the peaks, and you want the level to kind of come together. And it's like really subjective and odd to describe because how do you kind of describe like vibrations? Right? It's kind of kind of weird. But, you know, for the vibe, you just understand that, you know, it's the attack and release is important. Right? So if you, if you have busy drums, very fast attack, so it's fully released by the time another element comes in. Self-explanatory. Um... These different styles, there's some things going under the hood, right? So like non-linear attack and release and, um, you know, things like that. And what I mean by that is, you know, for the old school uh, compressor, like the, 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 uh, the, the analog compressors, if like, you know, something's kind of like, you know, uh, going over the threshold by like 3 dB, it'll be brought down by 3 dB. Very kind of uniform, but if something just just destroys like psh, like crashes that are like really like bananas it will like dynamically have a really quick attack like this is a really loud sound this is going to like hurt people so the attack will kind of change and like get shorter like it's it's you know like entire teams and companies get together to emulate these things because there's a lot going on and uh, I'm, I can't even begin to describe them, but it's not, like, linear. It's more, like, uh, reactionary. It reacts to uh, uh, your input signal. Anyway, yeah, so that would be bussing things together. And, uh, yeah, typically if you have uh, drums, and the drums are kind of together and stuff, I wouldn't have reverb on everything. I would drop in a really high-quality EQ. Uh, before the compressor or after. Like, there's no wrong way to go about it. And what this will do is this will put the drums and things into a space. And uh, that's that's really exciting because, like, you know, like the drums are, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's fun to get the drums sounding awesome because they're recorded kind of dry and in the studio or whatever. And then you can, like, transport them to, like, a cathedral in... I don't know, Eastern Europe, like a like a five million year old church with like skulls on on the walls and stuff like that. It's really exciting. Um, yeah, and uh, that's that for that. 
vocals vocals are are uh, are tricky um so say yeah i'm just gonna i think vocals is a is a completely different thing you want the vocals to it's better to have the vocals louder than quieter the vocals are too loud that's way better than them being too quiet so just keep that in mind um things like pianos and uh, keys, things that are attacky, don't take well to compression. So you, you really have to be careful. Uh, but they respond well to being put in spaces with reverb and delay. And that is like the cool, the cool factor, like the keys and like the synth and all that, that. That's like the cool factor. You can just have reverb in that. And you want to prepare everything that, and make it sound good before you get to the mastering stage. And that is uh, that video. It's about half an hour long. Hope you guys learn stuff. Take care and have a good one.